the idea behind this lesson is we're analyzing the styles of David Fincher and Aaron Sorkin as we work through um, creating our dialogue scenes. And we sort of uh, make our own interpretation of the first three pages of The Social Network. The reason that we're talking about Fincher and Sorkin, um, Fincher directed The Social Network, Aaron Sorkin was the writer of The Social Network. So pretty important that we look at them as, um, as we sort of interpret this script and where we should take it. I'm going to go ahead and start talking about Fincher, but I want to kind of let you know what the where we're going, what are we trying to learn. So one of the main things is we want to understand the aspects of David Fincher's film style that separate him from other directors. What makes Fincher unique? What makes him similar to other directors? Um, mostly we're going to look at what separates him. We're going to discuss a little bit about Fincher's insistence on shooting hundreds of takes, how that relates him to some other filmmakers, and how it takes a lot of sway to be able to do such things. Um, we're also going to talk about Aaron Sorkin, about the power of a writer on set, somebody especially with the type of pedigree that Sorkin does. We're going to talk about improv. Is improv something that actors should be able to do, should not be able to do? We'll also discuss, do we think that there are multiple ways to shoot a scene? Fincher is famous in saying that there is not. We're going to talk about the differences there and how I think there's sort of an in inherent lie in that statement from Fincher. We're also going to, s we're going to kind of discuss personally what could you use from Fincher's style to improve your own filmmaking. We're also going to discuss the benefits that Fincher uh, reaps from using visual effects to create an enhanced reality for the films. So... With all that being said, let's get underway. The supplemental materials are on the slideshow. You can find those in Google Classroom. They should be attached near this podcast. So let's get into it. Speaking first about David Fincher, I'm not going to give you a whole lot of biography. I feel like those things are somewhat useless when trying to study someone. It doesn't really matter where they were born or how they started working at a, you know, a corner market when they were young. It's not really that important. Though I do want to talk to you specifically about what are some characteristics of a Fincher film. And if you're in a discussion with other film-related people or people who love film, you know, how can you be confident in talking about what Fincher does in his films? So you see the list there on Google Classroom on slide two. The first thing that you can kind of think about is a surreal perfection of scenes. Fincher is a perfectionist, even though he doesn't like to be called one. If you're a rational person, you would call David Fincher a perfectionist. He's also quoted as saying that he prefers to show things in a wide proscenium view. Proscenium is a theater term. We're sort of meaning wide, like we want to show things as they are. He doesn't want the camera to become a character, as some filmmakers do. You can think about like found footage films like Cloverfield, where the camera becomes part of the part of the action, that is not something Fincher is interested in. Fincher wants the camera to be omniscient, to be there but not, to be part of the action but, you know, distinctly away from it. We should be almost spying on the characters. Something else that Fincher does to, that is not copied by a lot of other filmmakers is this heavy use of visual effects to create reality. And what I mean by that is that he uses visual effects in ways that other directors simply don't. He doesn't use visual effects to um, create fantastical worlds. Rather, Fincher creates visual effects or leverages visual effects to create an almost hyper-reality that he then sets the film within to achieve shots that would be impossible in the real world. He uses visual effects to achieve those, to enhance his creative vision to create a reality that is similar to our own, but just fantastical enough that we are taken somewhere else. You can think about scenes in Zodiac. The opening shot of Zodiac is a pretty standard, what looks like a helicopter shot of a waterfront in San Francisco. Not many people know that that shot is entirely CGI'd. It's not a single frame of real video. There was probably some reference, certainly, but it is the waterfront reconstructed 
as it would have been in the time of the film. Fincher makes sure that his historical films are historically accurate almost to an insane level. Other uses of this VFX to create reality also occur in Zodiac. Mark Ruffalo's character is on the street in what looks like a normal, outside, dimly lit conditions exterior shot. If you look at the behind the scenes footage, the entire thing was blue screen except for the cars and the ground. And Fincher is quoted as saying because he wanted the film to be as period accurate as possible. It was not supposed to be this portrayal of today. It was supposed to be a portrayal of that, which makes a lot of sense when you say it out loud, but still blue screening things to that extent is not something many other directors are comfortable with doing. The other thing that Fincher is known for doing is shooting hundreds of takes of a scene, even dialogue scenes that uh, many young filmmakers take for granted, that they just shoot their typical coverage and a wide shot, two close-ups, a couple over the shoulders, and they're done. That is not the way Fincher shoots his films. In The Social Network, the opening scene that we are taking on, they shot 99 takes of the opening scene. 99 takes of the opening scene. They didn't quite get to 100. But 99 takes in a scene that had probably 60 to 70 extras moving around the bar. It's a simple dialogue scene. But it's very important to setting up the character of Mark Zuckerberg, and it's very important to the rest of the film. So Fincher shot 99 takes of it. He does this with a lot of things, not just dialogue per se. There's a scene in Zodiac where Jake Gyllenhaal's character drops a book onto the seat. It's of drawings. It's, it's important to the plot. I won't get too far into it, but you can see in behind-the-scenes footage him dropping the book over and over and over again because there was just a certain way the book needed to bounce that would have looked great on camera, and they did it until they found it. Even other people got into the seat to throw the book to try to get it to do the thing that they want, and it reminds me of another filmmaker... One you would never really associate with David Fincher is they don't really operate in the same genre, but they have a similar sort of way of thinking about film, and that filmmaker is Jackie Chan. Jackie was famous for shooting hundreds of takes of action scenes or really impressive stunts. Think of the fan throw where it comes back to him. Think of scenes where he... Um, pulls off a very impressive, very impractical stunt, like hitting a pencil off a table. It flies into the air and he catches it. Those are not things that he was good at. He's quoted as saying that it's not good. It's just, do you have the patience to do it? And that is what Fincher's ideology of film is all about. He feels a sort of responsibility to the audience that he can't just make a film. He has to fully realize the vision in his head. And I find that admirable. He's also quoted talking about how you pay huge amounts of monies for actors to come in from all over the world. You pay hundreds of thousands for a set and for a crew to come in. And you pay for hotels and food. And then the idea is that the actors should go home as soon as possible. Fincher doesn't believe in short days of shooting. No, he is a perfectionist. And some actors are turned off by working with Fincher in this way. It's not appealing to want to shoot 100 takes of the same scene in a day. Mark Ruffalo was famously a little bit peeved at him after he felt that he really nailed the scene in Zodiac, only for Fincher to walk up to him, go directly past him, walk 30 feet behind Ruffalo, and move an extra three feet to the left, and then ask for everyone to shoot the take again. That's sort of the surreal perfection, the, the, the madness of Fincher in a way. But you sort of need to be a little mad in order to create such a perfect reality like his films do. So it's at this time that I'd like you to click on to slide three. Go ahead and watch the segment um, that is called The Relentless Number of Takes, and we'll come back after that. 